we'll continue on in the book of Romans, Paul's letter to the church at Rome. Before we begin this morning, I am going to pray, but I want to remind you and encourage you that last week we talked about how this is kind of a a subsection in the book of Romans that we're going through right now from verses 18 really through 32. And I shared with you last week that these are some of the, the heaviest passages, I believe, in Scripture and hard to preach in some ways. This morning we're going to touch on some sensitive topics, and it's going to be heavy, I promise you that. But the encouragement I have for you is stick it out. To the end of the sermon, I will not leave you without hope as I point you hopefully to Christ and the gospel. You will still have hope, but I promise you it will be heavy. So we need to pray. I need to pray and ask for the Spirit's help. Let's pray together. Lord, we do echo the the song and we say, How long, O Lord, until you will make things right? Until you will return and make things the way that they should be. But Lord, we also know that your timing is perfect. And so as we continue to live these lives, Lord, we do ask that you would help us by your Spirit. I thank you for everybody that's here this morning, Lord. In your providence, I am thankful that you have worked in such a way that they have chosen to come this morning so they could hear this message. And I am praying that you would soften hearts and soften minds, open eyes and open ears, That we would believe your truth. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would help me to be faithful to the text. I pray that I would have boldness to preach your truth and it would be in love. Help us now. Help me now. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We should finish Romans chapter 1 today and get into chapter 2 next week, Lord willing. Let me remind you quickly the the outline of uh, chapter 1. We had Paul's greeting in these first seven verses where he greets the church at Rome because he's never been to Rome. He didn't plant this church None of his co-workers planted this church. He knew a few people. We think that this church, again, came out of when we see in the early book of Acts at Pentecost where people came to faith and then went back to their countries. We think that's when the church at Rome started. He wrote to them, and in verses 8 through 15, he said that he longs to go to see them because he wants to impart some gift to them and he wants to be encouraged by them. And we we were blown away by the fact that the Apostle Paul needs encouragement from other people. And we need encouragement from one another. Amen? Amen. We need community. He explained that he is a slave to Christ and he is under obligation to preach the gospel. But then in verses 16 and 17, he says he's not ashamed of the gospel, the good news of Jesus. For it was the the power of God. We talked about that word as the dynamite, the explosion that comes. It is the Power of God for salvation. And with salvation we talked about, that's everything from justification to our sanctification to where we look more like Jesus to glorification, which is coming one day. He says, I'm not ashamed of it because it's the power of God and salvation to everybody who would believe. The Jew first, but also the Greek. And he said, in the gospel itself, we see the righteousness of God. We see the holiness of God. We see the love of God. And it is revealed for faith. Or from faith, for faith, rather. And we got into verse 18, and because of the holiness of God, we see that the, the wrath of God has been poured out. And we walked through this two weeks ago, verses 18 through 20. 
and talked about how in general revelation, what we see all around it, all people, all times, all places, what we do with our sinful nature is we suppress the truth. And because we suppress the truth, we are without excuse. General revelation is enough to condemn, not enough to save. We need special revelation, which is the revelation, which is the preaching of the gospel and the word of God. We then got into 21 through 25. And Paul went into some great detail to show us that we have not given God the glory that he deserves. We have not thanked him, but instead we have exchanged the glory of God for lies. Every human being. We have all claimed to be wise, but have become fools. We're going to finish the passage today, and now we're going to see the outworking. And as we go through, you're going to see three different times where it says God gave them up. And that's all of humanity. So let's read through the text, and then we'll work through it like we do verse by verse. For those of you who are new, you're probably wondering, why in the world are they going through this? What we do is we preach through books of the Bible, one verse at a time, so we can't avoid things, we can't dodge things, and we have to deal with passages. So in the providence of God, you're here today for this passage. Rejoice. (laughs) I'm going to read a little bit before our text today. We're really going to be 24 through 32. I'm just going to start up a little bit before that because it all goes together. Verse 18, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the mortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions, for their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents. Foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. Told you it'd be heavy. But I have some encouragement for you at the end. So let's work through. We're going to start in verse 24. Let's work through the text verse by verse. We all had claimed to be wise, we became fools, we exchanged the glory of the immortal God for these images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. And we talked about how this is idolatry. This is idolatry that we all have in our lives. And I did say, of course, that not, there's not many of us who have these little symbols, if you will, these little created things in our homes like other cultures, but we have our own idols. And somebody graciously pointed out to me after the sermon, look at the dollar bill and you will find all of them on there. Therefore, because of this exchange, therefore, verse 24, God gave them up. This is the first one. God has given us up to dishonorable passions. Well, what does that mean, Paul? 
I'm sorry, gave us up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves. What is he talking about here? He is specifically talking about sexual immorality. Sexual immorality is what he is starting off with. God has given us over to ourselves. In our sinful natures, this is where we want to go. Every time you see idolatry, you will find sexual immorality. It follows. And if you've looked at the notes this morning, you know this is going to get heavy. But here are some examples for you of what has gone on and what is going on in our world today. I'm going to begin with pornography. Pornography is a $6 billion to $15 billion business a year. That is more than all the major sports combined. 40 million people regularly visit pornography websites. 35% of all internet downloads have to do with pornography. One pornography site, listen to this, it blew my mind. In one year, there was enough time that was watched on this porn site that in one year it was equivalent to 665 centuries of time in one year. In 2016, there was a study done, and in 2016, if you were to download all the things that were seen and put those on USB drives, those little sticks, and line those up front end to back end, all the way around, it could go around the whole moon. There are 42 million websites 11 is the first average age that kids see it. 11. 68% of church-going men and over 50% of pastors statistically regularly view pornography. And 87% of Christian women have visited or seen pornography. What have we done? Pornography, no. What else is there? Adultery. The statistics say of those who have admitted to committing adultery, 25 to 33% of marriages, adultery takes place. That's of those admitting it, and that is the actual act, not as Jesus talks about going on in the heart. That's adultery as sex when you are married to somebody else. How about premarital sex, fornication? 70% worldwide have sex before marriage, and they're saying that by the age of 44, in the United States in particular, 90%. Not enough human trafficking. Almost a $100 billion business. The United States is one of those leading countries in this. 20 million to 40 million people, they don't know exactly, are human slaves today around the world, and at least half of those are sexual slaves. One in five children, girls, are sexually abused. One in 20 boys. You want to see what it looks like for God to turn us over to ourselves, this is what it looks like. And this is the wrath of God on all people. He lets us go our own way, go to ourselves, and this is where it ends up. You are not a good person on your own. I love you, but you're not. We're not. And even by His grace, He doesn't let us go as far as He could. The first thing that he says in verse 24 and 25 is he's given up, he has given us up to this impurity, the sexual sin that goes on all around because, verse 25, they exchange the truth about God for a lie and we worship and serve the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. This is where idolatry takes you. It leads to the next verse, 26. And now 
what Paul's going to do, and I want to be very clear here, he's going to give us a specific example. One of the most controversial passages in Scripture today. But he's going to give us a clear example of what he's talking about, of this exchange that has taken place. The exchange for what is natural, unnatural. Worshiping God as we should, worshiping the creature instead. What has happened for all of us internally, he's going to show something right now that we can see with our eyes. For this reason, verse 26, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves due penalty for their error. The last part there, the due penalty for their error, a lot of debate on what that's talking about. Could either be the due penalty for Walking in sin, yes, homosexual sin forever and not repenting of it, but also all sexual sin, all sin. If you do not repent of it, your due error, the due penalty, will be death eternally. In addition, some would argue that this is the the sin itself that they're given over to is the due penalty, and some would argue the things that happen in the homosexual atmosphere, the AIDS, other diseases, things like that, that it could be. There's no, it's not clear on what it is. It may be a mixture of all of that. We don't know. But go back to what happens. God gives them up to dishonorable passions. What happens here is God has created male and female. It's how he's created it, and that's how it is supposed to be. That is what is natural. But part of the wrath of God on all of humanity is we run to these other sexual sins, and this sexual sin comes. And so what we have here is, again, the wrath of God poured out on us, but kind of in a passive way, and we run to it ourselves. Not everybody struggles with this, but there are many of you who do. You have same-sex attraction. Let me explain to you that this is not natural. According to the Word of God, it is not natural. And the reason that Paul is pointing it out is to show us. It's something that we see That is not natural, but what it is showing us is the same thing that has happened in every one of our hearts. So he's not just picking on homosexuals here. It's the clearest example of something that we can see where the natural and the unnatural. I have some things I'll say at the end concerning that in particular. So Paul goes from this sexual immorality, big scope, to give us a specific example, and now to verse 28. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, we still don't acknowledge God, so God gave them up, the third one, to a debased mind. In your notes, you can see on there, there's a bunch of words, abandoned mind, a degenerate mind, degraded, wicked, sinful, perverted, criminal, corrupted. That's what that word means. He has given all of us up to this. To do what ought not to be done. And now, if you think that the first two sections didn't apply to you, if you have no sexual sin in your life and you don't struggle with homosexual things, Paul's going to go ahead and cover you right now. Here we go. And again, me too. Let's go. They were filled. (laughs) Stop right there. Filled. You, before Christ, were filled with this. It's still there in your sinful nature, battling, but filled with this. Look at this. Filled with all manner of unrighteousness. Oh, no, you're a good person. You should follow your heart. Not if you're filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, and malice. Just picking one of those out, covetousness, oh my goodness, how often do we look around and we are not satisfied with what we have and we want what others have, whether it's their stuff or their spouse or whatever it is, we're not content. Continuing on, they are full, full of envy, murder. You go, I don't murder. Read the book of James. You hate people, you murder. If you have hatred in your heart, you are a murderer. Strife. 
Look around, there's conflict everywhere. Look in your life, there's conflict with other people. Deceit, maliciousness. Oh, those are real serious ones. Don't worry, Paul says, I got more for you. Gossips. Why do we overlook this sin? Why will we focus on homosexuality? Make sure we speak out against that. But Paul here is saying, oh yeah, debased mind also means gossips. Slanderers. How often do you slander on social media? You don't even know the truth of what you're posting or forwarding. We do this. Haters of God. Insolent, haughty, pride, boastful, inventors of evil. And look at this for you who are younger, but guess what? Some of you are older and you still have parents. Disobedient to parents. The way you treat your parents shows what you think about God and if you have been renewed inside or not. You look at our culture. We do not love and honor our parents well. We're foolish, we're faithless, we're heartless, and we're ruthless. Do you find yourself on the list? If not, read it again. God gives us over, and Lord, what have we done? And then here's what happens, verse 32. Listen carefully. Here's what happens, verse 32. We do these things, and there was a time, even in this culture, where there were some things were taboo. You might do them, but you certainly didn't talk about them, and you didn't flaunt it, whatever it is. But then, as God gives us over, and a culture continues to go, here's what happens. Verse 32, though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die. God is holy. We are not. If you do any of these, even once you deserve to die, because if you break one, you break them all. They not only do them, but they give approval to those who do them. And then I'm going to tell you what happens next. They give approval, and then it becomes celebrated. It becomes celebrated, and then what happens is you go around and everybody has to agree, and everybody has to be tolerant, and everybody has to celebrate it. And then where it goes to after that is if you will not celebrate it, we will attack you. And everything gets flipped upside down. And that's what Paul has been saying. The natural things are now unnatural. And that's the end of chapter 1. but I promised you some encouragement. I hope this will be encouraging. We'll see. First encouragement to the non-Christian who's here. You've never truly trusted in the, the death of Jesus in your place for your sins on the cross. You're still trying to do it on your own. You think you're a good enough person to work your way to heaven. Guess what? Romans 1 just told you you're not. So what's the encouragement for you? Trust in Jesus. Trust in his death, burial, resurrection for you. Ask, cry out to God for the righteousness of his son and that his son would take away your sin. This is a free gift for anybody who wants it. And it is here for you today. If you are a non-Christian, it's time. Today is the day of salvation. Second encouragement for you Christians, as you look out into this world and you say, oh my gosh, so much darkness, Lord, what have we done? What is going on? As you think about that list of the sexual stuff that's happening, here's the encouragement for you. Darkness acts like darkness. Stop being surprised. Why would we look around and be surprised? It's exactly what he says in chapter 1 of Romans. Don't be surprised, but here's the encouragement. Don't run to it. Don't join it. Instead, be light. Love people. Preach the gospel. Realize they have no idea. Their minds are debased. They have no idea what's going on. They are lost, and they don't even know that they're lost. In church, are we even trying to find them? 
Be encouraged. Let's go and share the gospel. But also, do not put your hope in the world. It is upside down and backwards. Put your hope in Christ. Third encouragement. For those of you, those of you who are believers and you struggle with same-sex attraction. Realize this whole list that we went through in Romans. Realize that whole list is still in our sinful nature. How many of you still get angry as Christians? You better get your hands up. How many of you still covet at times? How many of you gossip at times? How many of you slander at times? Oh, but I'm a Christian. I shouldn't do any of these things. You are still in your sinful nature. Now, you've been given the Spirit of God. You've been given a new heart, and our minds are being renewed the more that we study the Word of God. But this is still your sinful nature. The difference is this doesn't define you anymore. It doesn't define you. Yes, praise the Lord, it doesn't define you. But that doesn't mean you don't struggle and you don't have temptation. Amen? So if you are here and you struggle with same-sex attraction, what has happened is that has become one of the sins, especially in the American church, that we don't really talk about and we don't offer you much help for. What I'd want to say to you is realize the fact that you still struggle is unnatural and it is a part of the wrath of God on all of us. And then for you in particular, that is part of your struggle. Just like me, I struggle with pride. Some of you struggle with anger or greed or whatever it is. This is part of your struggle in your sinful nature. God may take it away from you in this life or he may not. But I promise you this, just like every other struggle we have, here's what he's doing with it. He is conforming you to the image of his son through it. Be encouraged, brother or sister who struggles with this. Do not give in to it. Your battle is the same as our battle. It's just slightly focused on something else. So I have three verses for you, brother or sister who struggles with this, but also this applies to all of us. Realize, again, that this is unnatural. All these things are unnatural to how it should be. So here's what Jesus says in Luke 9, 23 through 25. And he said to all them, if any of you would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and what? Follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Brother or sister who's struggling with same-sex attraction, here's what I would say. Die to yourself, deny yourself through the Holy Spirit, and follow Jesus. Well, what if, doesn't he want me to be happy? Listen, he wants you to be holy. He wants you to look like his son. And this might be what he's given you to do that. I don't know. But I promise you he was working it for your good and his glory. Being single ain't that bad, too. Jesus was. Paul was. If that's what God has for you, then he will, his grace will be sufficient for you. Another verse for you. Colossians 3, 1 through 4. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. This is for you that struggles with this, this is for all of us. Seek what is above. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. For you have, what's that word say? You have what? Died. Your life is hidden with Christ. Your sexuality does not define you. Christ is where your identity is. This is true for all of us. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Romans 12, 1 and 2. How do I do this, Lord? What do I do? I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. This goes with the same-sex attraction. This goes with all of us with this sexual sin. By the mercies of God, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. It is your worship. Do not be conformed to this world. Don't go along with what the world is doing. It's not right. But be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, acceptable, and perfect. Brother or sister, realize this is a struggle that God has allowed in your life, but it's to conform you to the image of His Son. Which leads to Encouragement for Christians as they interact with believing and non-believing people that have same-sex attraction. 
For you, if you don't struggle with this, here's some hints for you or some encouragements as you interact with those who struggle. You don't say it's okay to have a homosexual relationship or lifestyle because the Bible doesn't say it's okay. But what you do say is Jesus is better. Jesus is better. And you understand that that sin gets you to the same place as every other sin. The difference in this passage of why Paul's using it is because it shows us the unnatural ways that have happened in all of our hearts. So you encourage, you share the gospel with, you open it up. Think about how we have accountability with one another and we share our struggles and our sins about many things. But this one, there are some of you in this church who struggle with this and you do not feel free to share it because we have not done a good job making this a safe place. It should be. It should be a place that we can share and fight sin together. Amen? Amen. The last thing, we're going to close with this. Here's the encouragement for you, Christian, as you look at your own life. The encouragement for you, Christian, as you look at your own life in light of this passage. It's going to be a few months before we get to Romans chapter 8. But I want to share it with you because this is the encouragement. Everything is under the wrath of God because of our sin. All of creation. But let me start with Romans 8 verse 1. Listen carefully to me, Christian. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. You are not condemned, Christian, for those things, even though in your sinful nature they come up over and over and over again. You are not condemned. And what is so interesting is even though in a passive way we're under the wrath of God, that is not what's happening for you now, Christian. Chapter 1 talks about the wrath of God, no question. But what's so interesting for you, Christian, who has come to faith, listen carefully. Every one of those sins that you see on there that you struggle with, everything from that to cancer, to coronavirus, to stubbing your toe, to pranks that are pulled on you at your house by wild kids. (laughs) When people talk bad about you, Every single thing that happens, listen carefully to me. Starting in verse 18. Listen to the Spirit, don't listen to me. Verse 18. For I consider, Paul says, that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation, listen to this, all creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. Even creation is waiting for things to get made right. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. This is talking about the fall, of course. Verse 22 here, I'm going to say, For we know that the whole, cre- whole, that we know that whole creation has been groaning together in pains of childbirth until now. Now watch this, verse 24. For in this hope we are saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope for who hopes for what he sees. But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. So here we go. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in, your we- in our weaknesses. He helps you in your weaknesses. For even when you do not know what to pray, the Spirit himself intercedes for you with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches the heart knows what the mind is of the Spirit. The Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. This is saying things are messed up. Creation even knows it's messed up. We don't even know what to do. We're groaning. We're praying. We don't even know what to cry. And the Spirit prays for us. Now here's what we read at the beginning, and we're ending with this. And we know that for those who love God, Christian, do you love God? By His grace, do you love God? Then here's what it is. Everything from stubbing your toe to the coronavirus to cancer to death, everything, here we go, works all things together for good. Your own trials, the sins that you have, even when you sin, the fact that you repent, he is working that for your good to conform you to the image of his son for those who are called according to his purposes. Because look at this and take great rest here, Christian 29, for those whom he foreknew, those that he knew intimately before time, 
he also predestined to be conformed to the what? Image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among brothers. He has conformed you to the image of his son and predestined that so that you would be part of his family adopted in, in verse 30, and those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Christian, when you look at your life and you say, I don't know why I sin all the time. I struggle. I'm just, I feel worthless. You're not worthless. You have been bought with the precious blood of Christ. He loves you. He has called you. He has justified you. He will glorify you. He is sanctifying you and realize every single thing. Think on it right now in your mind. What went wrong this week? He's using it for your good. He's using it for your good and for his glory. Amen?